Three, two, one. Welcome to Malaga's History Channel. Today we're going to talk about, very quietly and not loudly, we are going to talk about Mesoamerica. From its origins all the way up through, hopefully, the revolutions in the transatlantic world. Mesoamerica very simply means Middle Earth. Um, like the Hobbit book people, Lord of the Rings. And Mesoamerica, meaning Middle America, goes from Mexico on down to the top of South America, like Venezuela. Um, it leaves out North and South America for the most part. But humans got to the Americas over the Bering Strait, which was an ice bridge that lasted <clears throat> for centuries up until uh, you know, about 10,000 years ago. So 25, 30,000 years ago, people crossed from Asia to Alaska and then slowly began to migrate North and South America. It's going to take a very, very long time. Around 10,000 years ago, when the Ice Age ended, the Bering Strait melted, leaving the Aleutian Islands. At that point, the people in the Americas are going to be cut off from cultural diffusion. Yes, sir. So the Bering Strait was uh, that like spin off of Alaska? Yeah. Not, not up north where it's like really. No, where it's real close. Nope, it was right here. Okay. All right. The last Aleutian Island chain, um, the Atu in America, is about 12 miles from the coast of Asia. I mean, it's not that far. I mean, you can like see it, you know. Um, but from this point on, the Americas will be cut off from cultural diffusion. They will do the same things as everybody else in Africa, Europe, and Asia, except they will just do it a little bit later. And so migration takes a long time. In North America, you've got the Rocky Mountains, which are a barrier. You've got the Great Plains, the Mississippi River. So it takes a long time to get to the Atlantic Ocean. A lot of people just swoop right down the coastline into Mexico, and they just keep on going. So um, that is the early part of Mesoamerica. The important factor in that is that they are cut off. They will do a lot of the other stuff. It's just going to take them a long time. And the Americas are special because virtually from North America on downward, the soil is very good for the most part for farming. The Americas are agriculturally very rich. And there are many, many river basins that are similar to the four river valleys of Egypt, Mesopotamia, India, and China. The difference in the Americas is that while the rivers are not as big as the Tigris and the Euphrates and the Nile and the Indus, there's a whole lot more of them. All right? They're smaller but more plentiful. And so the Americas also are full of a lot of trade goods that people will use everything from bird feathers to the most precious gift from the Americas to the world, which is something I like to eat. Corn, all right, corn, all right, rich in protein and obsidian, as well as gold and silver. So, um, Mesoamerica will be diverse, and they will form many separate and distinct cultural traditions. And villages or cities in the Americas get started around 1500 B.C., that is significant because our, our villages are getting started in 1500 BC. Over in Asia, Africa, and Europe, we already have civilizations in 3000. So in the other parts of the world, we have massive civilizations and cities in 3000 BCE, when 1,500 1, years later, the Mesoamericans are just getting started. They're just at the village level. So right away, they're 1,500 years behind. So um, um, in Mesoamerica, the river valley civilizations, so to speak, 
will not develop separately like the river valley civilization or simultaneously like the river valley civilizations one will come right after the other so it's not simultaneous civilization growing it's one after another after another does that make sense okay great uh, um so um, one of the major differences is that the people in Mesoamerica did not develop the wheel. Um, the hunter-gatherers that came over via the Bering Strait were following, like, you know, caribou or, or reindeer or woolly mammoths. And so there were no large beasts of burden in the Americas, no horses, no camels, no oxen. So all labor was done. Um, by human means. So there was no need to develop the wheel. So that is one thing that will not be um, created in the, in the Americas. So um, one of the first civilizations um, is, are the, the Olmecs. And between the Olmecs and Spanish conquest, this long period of separation between the Americas and the rest of the world will wreak havoc on historical documents. We simply don't know a lot of what happened back then because it was either not written down and reported orally or it was destroyed when everyone's favorite friends, the, the Spanish, rolled into town. So. The formative civilization in Mesoamerica, kind of the river valley equivalent, will be the Olmecs. And the Olmecs, we know that they are the oldest because they come from old Mexico. Forest, your mind is a steel trap. It's brilliant. Or that acronym joke was just too good. That's what I think, Big Show, Miss Cho. Old Mexico. Um, and the Olmecs are going to be known for several reasons. Number one, they began glyph writing. They wrote in American hieroglyphics. They also carved those enormous, giant stone heads that are eerily reminiscent of other structures found in the Pacific Islands, all the way over to China. They look um, very, very, very similar. In the Olmec cities, there will be two big ones, San Lorenzo and La Venta. They were sort of twin cities, but they were around at different times. San Lorenzo was dominantly on top, and as it began to decline, La Venta rose in power. So they just kind of flip-flopped. One was great, while the other one was very small. Um, we know that the Olmecs were excellent engineers. They did a lot of irrigation to water their crops. And they will build the first pyramid of the Americas. It will be the same shape as the pyramids in Mesopotamia and in Egypt. It will also be used for religious purposes. It'll just be smaller. Um, it is 110 feet, or roughly a quarter the size of the Great Pyramid of Cheops in Egypt, but it's still there. Um, the Olmecs controlled some sort of um, elaborate trade network on the Gulf of Mexico, and we have found Olmec artifacts as far north as Louisiana and Mississippi. Um, so, um, the Olmec civilization will begin to decline right around 400 BC. So right as the ancient Greek civilization was rising to prominence in the European world, the Olmecs collapsed. They will run from basically 1000 BC to about 400 BC, about 600 years. After that, there is the regional empire 
of Monte Alban, which is kind of its own little civilization. And they will run from 400 BC to about 280. So think of them as being a parallel with ancient Rome or Han Dynasty China. Yes, ma'am. 400 BC to about 200 AD. And Monte Alban is like a regional empire. It's like a city-state around its own little empire. It was not attached to a giant civilization. And Monte Alban is pretty key because they come up with um, not only the first evidence of human sacrifice in Mesoamerica, but they are the guys who come up with the interlocking solar and lunar calendar, forming the infinity symbol. That is very accurate. It's 365 in one half days with a 52-year century. And once we discovered how to read and calculate that, it allowed us to, to match up um, the Mayan system of the long count to accurately date what was going on in the Americas with similar events in the European world. So very mathematically precise and intense, and they started um, human sacrifice. And the calendar that the people of Monte Alban created was used by everybody else in the Americas until the Spanish show up. Next up is a smaller regional empire known as Teotihuacan. And they will be centered about 30 miles north of modern-day Mexico City, or 30, day, 30 miles north of Tenochtitlan. And Teotihuacan is another regional empire, and it is the first true city-state of the Americas. Um, it was um, surrounded by mountains, so it had a lot of natural protection and a vast cave network from which they could mine obsidian, which they used for tools and for money. And because of their key location in the middle of Mexico, they traded from the um, Gulf of Mexico over to the Pacific Ocean, so across the width of Mexico. Um, the biggest, well, it was the big city, and it was very large and had a large um, population, about 150,000 people, making it one of the largest cities in the world at the time. And in, am I going too fast? Like I'm just flying today, no? What's that? Does someone say a little? All right, I'm good. All right. Teotihuacan had strong governmental authority. And this was evident in their large public works projects. The people of Teotihuacan built the great pyramids of the sun and the moon. The pyramid of the sun at one end of the plaza was 210 feet tall, covered in solid gold. And at the opposite or south end of the plaza, was the 120-foot pyramid of the moon coated in silver. They were built at the same time, once again showing us there was great organization, there was planning, a central figure saying this is what we are going to do, how and when we are going to do it. Labor is organized and building material is organized. It's all right there. Um, Teotihuacan is also known for its three-mile-long Avenue of the Dead. Important religious and political figures were buried in columns built into the mountainside and covered with a scary mask to chase away the evil spirits. And as you walk into the city, you had to go in front of all of them. And if you were an evil spirit, they would jump out and like get you. <laughs> Sorry, my throat hurts. All right, so um, the people of Teotihuacan 
were also expert traders and they traded with pretty much everyone and anyone. And they welcomed traders to their empire, but it got so big that the city had to grow and expand. And as it did, they kind of eminent domained or stole farmland from their own farmers, displaced them, and moved them back out into the hills. You remember the ancient Roman policy was they built a city when it maxed out. They didn't tear down you know, trees and expand the city. They moved 10, 15 miles away and built another city. Well, T.O.T. Oaxacan has kept growing and growing and growing and growing, and it got too big. Um, they um, were really big into human sacrifice. That was one of their big things. But instead of killing prisoners, the people of T.O.T. Oaxacan would sacrifice or one of the leading nobles would cut themselves and drip their blood over an offering because their noble blood was more like special, more powerful. And so the polytheistic gods liked it um, much better. It is here that we see the first appearance of Quetzalcoatl, the giant winged serpent that we will see in all other Mesoamerican civilizations. And T.O.T. Um, Oaxacan will, will fade out um, around 500 um, A.D. Um, their influence begins to wane. There is an unexplicable or inexplicable massive fire in T.O.T. Oaxacan. We're not sure what happened, but they just pretty much disappear. But their influence is seen in the great Aztec Empire, which will come a couple hundred years down the line. They try and model a lot of what they do on T.O.T. Oaxacan. But before that, we have the great um, Mayan Empire. And the Mayans, and this new blue marker I found, I really like the color. Uh, it's a good one. All right. Mayans will run from about 300 A.D. to about 900 A.D. So they will start right as ancient Rome is beginning to collapse, and they will last through the heart of the Dark Ages in Western Europe. It will also be the Warring States era in ancient China. And the Mayans are the first real big empire in Mesoamerica, in the Yucatan Peninsula. As if you envision Mexico as like an arm flexing, the Yucatan is like the hand. A lot of resorts, Cancun, Cozumel, um, Tulum, Chichen Itza, Mayan ruins are all... Did I say that right? Yes. Oh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of the name. Yeah, and that's what you just said it. Right. <laughs> All right. It's okay. Did you hand out your little snack all items? Yeah. All right. We're good. Okay. Where were you? Well, we could save them until tomorrow. No, I'm good. I just want to make sure you guys were. I had a piece of pizza and a garlic. Not. I'm good. I'm good for like the next 24 hours. All right. So, all right. Um, Mayan civilization. Um, the Mayas, dominant between 300 and 900 A.D. They were excellent record keepers, and they have the very first extensive writing system in Mesoamerica. They not only wrote on paper, but on pottery, on their religious buildings. There's only one problem. Why can we not read it? There's no Rosetta Stone, exactly. All right, so we're not really sure um, how to read it. The largest city in the Mayan Empire was Tikal. It had a population roughly matching the size of modern-day Chapel Hill, about 50 to 70,000. They were the first to develop terraced agriculture. 
That is digging flat spots or stairs into a mountain for agriculture. That way when the water runs down the mountain, the slope is not steep and it will not wash all the crops away, thus allowing you to grow more food. If we have a Mesoamerica DBQ, you guys better grab it by the string and take a baseball bat and just smash all the candy out of that pinata because we had better own it. Or I will pray tonight for a Mesoamerican DBQ. Don't fail me, Jared Devon. I know where you live. Literally, I know where you live. All right. You live close to or you live close, Max? Uh, yeah, I live uh, like two blocks away from there. Really? I didn't know where Max lives. Towards North Greensboro or toward William Woods? You're a fair oaker? Ooh, a cobblestoner. Yeah, well, you're fancy. All right, yeah. All right. The fair oak sign is like in my backyard. Don't tell me that, Max. I'm just kidding. Shh. Silencio, one, two, three, eyes on me. Thank you, Harish. At least somebody knows what's going on. All right. So, Tikal has the largest population because of terracing, and it is the largest city, but it is not the capital cities. The Mayan Empire was governed through 39 smaller little sub-cities. All right, like miniature versions of itself that controlled regional empires. So anyway, the Mayans were very similar to the ancient Greek city-states. There just was not a whole lot of them. Very similar to what we saw in Africa in... We went over it yesterday. Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. Okay, there we go. All right. All right. In Zimbabwe. All right. So, now, Tikal was at the center of a lot of these smaller river but lush river valleys that I told you about. And so they formed a trading treaty with T.O.T. Oaxacan before it, it collapsed. And Tikal was an economic powerhouse but not the capital. One of the interesting things about each of these 39 Mayan cities is each one was ruled by one single ruling family. Like there was the Yamatos in Japan, whose line was never usurped. Well, in the Mayans, there were 39 ruling families who led their cities from the beginning to the end. They were single family dynasties. Kind of um, interesting. Um, there were um, frequent wars between the Mayan cities and their royal rulers, um, just kind of vying for like dominance or, or, or trade goods. And the Mayans were large practitioners of human sacrifice to appease um, their gods. The Mayan religion was extremely intricate and complex. It had a deep impact on not only their religious, but their social life as well. There was no distinction between earth and heaven for the ancient Mayas. And the Mayas used their, um, like kind of like Japan, symbols of nature. The more powerful the symbol of nature was, the more powerful your family was. So like a jaguar or a big river, or a mountain lion. That was big time mojo, a waterfall, something that had a lot of, of power to it, as church and state were, were intertwined. So really similar to Japan. Very similar to Japan. Um, temples were used to showcase each city-state's power, and they also practiced on a wide scale, what is known throughout Mesoamerica is the ritualistic ball game. Kind of the part soccer, part basketball, part rugby, part lacrosse, anything goes game. It depended on where you were. Sometimes the winner 
was sacrificed. They were meant to go and help these twins who had been killed defeat the evil gods. And the twins were resurrected as the sun and the star Venus. So you would go help them combat evil. Sometimes if you were a scrub loser and your team stunk, you got sacrificed simply because you were a disgrace. You were a loser. And we can't do, we can't just work with you. So anyway, um, uh, you can see this um, in, uh, at Chichen Itza, um, where the ball court is um, still there, and in the sacrificial temples at Tulum, if you ever go on a cruise. The Mayans had an interesting and complex mathematical system. They were among the first in the world to use the concept of a zero. And they developed the calendar known as the long count and matching it with the solar and the lunar calendar of Monte Alban, we were able to accurately date what was going on in the American world. Um, told you about these, oh, women. Um, women in the Mayan society had a lot of rights, power, and privileges. Two of them were actually queens of Mayan cities, very reminiscent of Queen Hatshepsut of ancient Egypt. The Mayans will fade away right around 900 BC. And the next important group that will come along that will run Mesoamerica, yes sir? AD, did I say BC? I'm sorry, AD, we're in AD. I'm just trying to like pedal to the metal here. BC, AD, CD. ACDC. <laughs> Dirty deeds. Oh, I'm sorry. I went hair metal. All right. AD. The next group will be powerful for a short, brief period, but they leave a big impact, and they are the Aztecs. And we wrote Aztecs in red. Why? Blood. They like blood. All right. Very good. 1,200 to about 1,500 the Aztecs are nomadic warriors who come into central Mexico and they serve as the army for a smaller regional empire known as the Toltecs. When the Aztecs decide, you know what, we're going to take this unit over. And so think of the European Renaissance up into the age of exploration as when the Aztecs dominate Mesoamerica. They are warriors who want to expand their large territory. And when they conquer you, they are extractive. They want to suck resources out of the ground to make them rich and wealthy. So whatever you make or you grow or you harvest as your big crop, you are going to give that to the Aztecs. Aztec people paid no taxes. And so one city had to make 700,000 cloaks for the Aztecs. Another one had to give um, 20 tons of corn to the Aztecs. They took a lot and they left you just enough to survive and keep you weak so you would be easy to come and be conquered and have war captives taken from your civilization. Um, the Aztec um, army did not have a standing army. Um, every person had to participate and do military service, much like ancient Athens and Sparta. Everyone has to participate. And the Aztecs were the largest practitioners of human sacrifice in the ancient world. To them, their God was powered by blood. If he does not get enough, he will not be able to defeat night, and he will not rise again the next day. So an Aztec warrior, your worth was measured in not how many people you kill, but how many captives you bring back that can be sacrificed. 
So Aztec combat is violent, but they weren't trying to kill you in combat. They wanted to sacrifice you later. If you were a particularly difficult warrior to subdue, say it takes nine or ten guys to knock you out, they would not only sacrifice you, but the leading warriors would then also drink your blood and eat you so they could absorb your power. That's always a nice thought. All right. Well, you were a really tough fighter, so mm. everybody have fun tonight. Everybody eat Wang Mang tonight. Mm. All right. All right. Poor Wang Mang. He tried really hard, all right? So, anyway, um, so, um, the capital is the great city of Tenochtitlan. Tenochtitlan is on, I may have told you this, on my flux capacitor um, bucket list when I can travel back in time. One of the first places I'm going to go is Tenochtitlan because it had to look awesome. Built in the middle of Lake Texacoco, often referred to as the Europe or the Mexican version of Venice, it was this beautiful, bustling city that floated in the middle of a lake for safety. There were four bridges that connected Tenochtitlan to the mainland that could be pulled out in case they were ever attacked or laid siege to. Um, floating in the middle of the lake to give them food were the floating gardens known as chimpanas and the intense aqueduct system that, that flushed out the brine from water so it, it desalinated the water and you had one tube of fresh water being brought into the city every day while the other tube was being cleaned and scrubbed for bacteria and when they were done with it they blocked off the current tube being used let water flow through the clean one while they clean and decontaminated the other aqueduct. Brilliant engineers as well as um, warriors. Um, Aztec society um, uh, was so big that it will house around two to three hundred thousand people. And there was a market you could visibly see from the top of the mountains, as described by Cortez, as a bustling like giant Sam's Club or Costco, where 60,000 people would come every day and buy everything from shoes and clothes to the food they ate. It was just incredible. And there was so much gold laying on the ground that they covered the whole city with gold. The government was completely authoritarian. Easy way to think of the Aztecs is they are a larger version of ancient Sparta. The government was militarily, militarily controlled and organized along those lines. There was a very strict hierarchy and only two basic social classes, the nobles and the commoners. Forrest, you're hanging in there. You tired? You want a break? No, Maziel, you want a break? Mm -hmm. You guys sure? Parks, you awake? <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> All right. Everybody lived in a little district called a Kapuli. In a Kapuli, I liken to ethnic neighborhoods during the period of immigration where the Poles lived on this block, the Italians on this block, block, the Irish on this block, the Hebrews on this block. And your world, your school, your church, your synagogue, your friends were all within that defined area. Like it's where you went to the grocery store, it's who you socialized with, it's where you played as a kid. That's where it was. Like my... Um, Father-in-law says his block was from 109th to 111th Washtenaw, Morgan Park, Southside, Chicago. I'm like, what was on like 112th and 108th? And he says, hell, I don't know. I never went there. I stayed in 109 and 111th. So um, that was their little world. Grocery store, school, church, synagogue, mosque, temple, spaceship. I'm just going Scientologist here. I'm trying to be inclusive. I don't even know. All right. So, aliens. What did Ann Connor say? Like, aliens 
oh, fall yeah, off of you. Dude, that's some serious drug usage right there. I said that live on YouTube, Tom Cruise. So, all right, all right. So anyway, um, so I have no problem with that. Anyway, um, so um, anyway, I uh, forget what I was saying. Um, Kapuli. Sorry. Um, everybody there um, was trained to be in the army, and the um, education was done by kind of like home ownership Nazi groups who made sure that everybody worked for the government, everybody was going to school, everybody was doing their military training. Um, the Aztecs will remain a large, vibrant civilization until everyone's favorite conquistador, Hernando Cortez, rolled into town in 1519. And as he describes the beauty and the splendor of Tenochtitlan, he goes, man, that place is so cool. It's bustling. It's fabulous. It's an engineering masterpiece. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go destroy it now. All right. Oh, clearly, logically, that makes sense. Um, so, um, uh, moving past that, there, we're going to move down to South America. And there are three small civilizations in South America around Peru. The Chavin, the Mojica, and the Nazca. And they are very, very small. But the Chavin are the original settlers into what is today Venezuela and Peru. So they will be the root civilization in South America from which the Incas will eventually spring. Um, following them were the Mojica people. Who will, yes, sir? Is that like the last of the Mojicans? No, no, but, but yeah, nor, but very, a very, very close spelling. Um, the Mojica will, will run along um, with the Byzantine Empire in, in Europe. And it is the Mojica people that will begin to build the road system to speed communication along the coast of the Peru that will be later mastered by the great Incan Empire. And the last group of people that will help form the Incas are the Nazca people. And they are mostly known for their gigantic glyphs of like spiders and birds carved into the plains of Peru. People think they were landing markers for aliens and all of this stuff. So these three groups, the Chavin, the Mojica, and the Nazca, will blend to form the Inca. A parallel to them would be the Minoans, the Mycenaeans, and the Dorians forming ancient Greece, thank you. <laughs> babies. What type of babies? Come on, Mycenaeans? Come on, man. Troy? Damn, Helen? I didn't think we had to go over that stuff. I thought you, don't you guys get like mythology all the time? Yeah. Like middle school, Percy Jackson? Yeah. Percy Jackson. You know. All right. Hercules, Tom Stamp, don't you guys get any of that stuff? <laughs> Did he make you read the Odyssey? Uh, uh, well, some year. She make you read the Odyssey? Yes. Yes, was great. Really? Yeah. Well, we didn't do anything. That's why it was great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was completely oblivious to everything that happened. Yeah, that was funny. All right. <laughs> Incas will be named for a series of ruins high in the Andes Mountains. Um, they will start around 850 A.D. And the Incas will have one of the largest, well, they have one of the largest empires in the world, clearly the largest one in the Americas, stretching over 2,000 miles from the Pacific coast to the length of the Amazon River Basin. So north and south and east and west across 
South America. A good comparison to the Incan Empire would be ancient Rome after they conquered Carthage. Incas are a massive empire with hundreds of different ethnicities and groups inside of it. Their capital was a place called Cusco, which meant um, the land of four quarters. It's where everything met. And there was a lot of diversity in the empire, and the leader of it was the Sapa Inca. He was the king of the Incas. And the Sapa was seen as a direct descendant of the gods, and he was so important that he never wore the same article of clothing twice. Every day he had a new royal outfit made for him. So, kind of like Catherine Cho's closet. So, um, have you ever worn the same thing twice this year, Catherine? I don't think so. No, I don't remember. I have. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. <laughs> Me too. I have like five shirts and six pairs of pants. That's pretty much all I got. So, anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, in the Incan Empire, they had two um, cities, two temples rather, one made of gold and the other made of silver. The Incas were more rich in silver than they were gold. And the Incas will spread their empire through a combination of of intimidation and influence. They would militarily take you over. But first of all, they would ask you to join their empire. If you said no, they would come and build a small warehouse and lay out all of the fabulous things that they had in their empire. And they would have you walk through it, hoping you would say, man, they got a lot of, they got a lot of stuff. If that didn't impress you, then they would militarily take you over. But they tried to do it peacefully as they possibly could. Um, as a result, um, the Incas will organize their realm into a very strict hierarchy to make sure everything is controlled. And the Inca will impose their language on those that they conquer. In order to control it, we all have to be united. If you showed any type of disobedience or possible being a revolutionary, they would force you to relocate. They would move someone from the jungle and make them live high atop the mountains. If I make you uncomfortable, if I remove you from your place where you know how the seasons change and animals migrate, well, if I move you to someplace completely different, you're going to spend so much time, time trying to survive, you're not going to have time to rebel. That was their, their thought, thought process. Um, their engineering um, was a masterful. They required all of their men to take part in something known as the Mita system, where every individual had to work a certain number of days per year on royal projects. It's how you paid your taxes. And with the Mita system, um, they built a lot of their amazing technology from the 14,000 miles of roads that went from hot, humid jungles to arid, snow-capped mountains where steps were cut into the mountain. Sometimes the trail was 5, 10 yards wide. Sometimes it was a narrow little footpath. To cross over rivers and gorges, they built rope suspension bridges. And all along this 14,000-mile road network, there were relay stations. There are no large beasts of burden, so there were buff cross-country runners like Max running back and forth. You would sprint five or six miles, get to a relay station, tag out and pass the message while the next guy sprinted five or six miles. It's how they could cover the entire road network for communication and military purposes. 
was sort of the human pony um, express. Um, there was also um, a group known as the Makuna, and the Makuna were um, special women chosen to serve the Sapa Inca. Um, their job was to brew him a special beer called chicha for religious ceremonies and to make his clothes. They were highly specialized and protected. Every now and then, they would be married off to cement an alliance. But they lived lives of purity. From 6 to 16, you learned how to sew and how to make the chicha. From 16 to 36, you did those jobs um, for the Sapa Inca. From 36 to 46, you taught the younger girls how to do it. At 46, you could then opt to get married or you lived a life of state retirement. While you had to be celibate your entire life, you lived pretty good. All right, You were in the palace and you got to stay in the nice part of the neighborhood when you um, retired. Um, the Incas were also incredible builders as they built cities high in the oxygen-starved Andes Mountains like Machu Picchu, where in order to grow necessary food, they mastered terrace farming. farming. Yes. All right. So, just like the um, Aztecs, the Incas will collapse when Francisco Pizarro shows up under a quest for silver. And it is at this time that the Americas are joined into the global economy during exploration and colonization, all done to make the mother country rich. Do we need to go over colonization in any of that stuff? Great, because I got to go get my daughter. So anyway, any questions? Tomorrow, we're going to do Greece, Rome, the Middle Ages, and I'm going to open up the floor for whatever you guys want or need. Monday, we're going to do a little crash course essay session, and then it's game time. Tomorrow, during La Classe, the UN, creation of Israel, Cuba, Korea and Vietnam. Good morning, Vietnam. I'm sorry, I'm going to stop.